neighborhood. So, you know, you guys have heard already from Olivia San Wong, who is with the Zone 7 Water Board. You've also heard from Rita DeCandida. She's uh, with the City of Pleasanton's uh, Water Department, and she's actually in charge of the Environmental Services Department, and water is just one component of that. But that is really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to um, all of the regulatory and government agencies who are involved with our water. So today I'm not going to be able to go into a tremendous amount of detail, but I am going to be able to share with you uh, the structure of our water governance that impacts Pleasanton's water supply. And I've uploaded these slides to Blackboard and to our Google Drive because everything you see underlined is a link. So I've embedded, I spent a lot of time embedding links so that if you're curious about any component of this presentation, you'll be able to get a hold of the slides and click on those links. And I really encourage you to do that um, because there is a lot more to water governance than you might be able to imagine and, and clicking on those links will help you a lot. So today I'm going to cover the four main layers or categories under which our water falls. We've got federal regulators and governance uh, pieces. We've got state, regional, and local. So at the federal level, the US EPA um, has several different offices within the EPA but there is an office of water. And the EPA, if you remember the three branches of government, they're part of the executive branch. When Congress passes laws like uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act or the Clean Water Act, it is the job of the executive branch of government to enact those laws and to enforce those laws. And that is done through the US EPA. So you can see, I'm not gonna read my slides, uh, what their overarching uh, mission is when it comes to water in the United States. But you should also know that the US EPA is broken up into 10 regions and we live in region nine. So there is also, um, they are mostly in San Francisco, they have offices in other parts of the region because it's a multi-state region. But uh, the US EPA office has representatives here in our local area that carry out their mission in our area when it comes to water. And I'm gonna go into more detail about what they do in a moment. At the state, we have the California um, Water Resources Control Board, and you can see their mission there. Um, California EPA is also part of the executive branch. So when our state legislature passes laws regarding anything having to do with our water, it is up to Cal EPA and their administrator is appointed by the governor to enact and to enforce the laws that are passed by our legislature. So we'll get into how they do that in a moment. Now, our state water resources control board is broken up further into regions and California's regional water boards are based upon what's called basins. And we live in the San Francisco basin. And so it is the job of our regional water control board to develop uh, enforcement and uh, programs that enforce state and federal laws when it comes to water, and also to create a plan uh, to protect our water in this basin, in the San Francisco basin. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a moment. And then at the local level, we actually have four different water agencies that are um, charged with different aspects of our water. You already heard from Olivia San Wong that Zone 7 is in charge of both water supply and flood control. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, LAGMA is actually um, a, a joint powers authority between multiple jurisdictions and their main job is to get treated water or wastewater uh, out to the bay um, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. I'll actually show you a map of their system for conveying everything we flush down the toilet and wash down the drain out to the bay. So that's their job. 
Uh, DSRSD is the Dublin San Ramon Services District. Their main job is wastewater, but they also deal with um, recycled water. So there is um, a, a, some not necessarily a potable water aspect, but some uh, water for irrigation that they deal with as well. And then of course the city of Pleasanton um, delivers water. They have to maintain our sewer systems and our storm drain systems. And I'll talk more about each of those in just a moment. So let's talk about the EPA Office of Water. So the EPA is broken into several components. Water is just one, but within the Office of Water, there are sub offices. There are four, and you can see them here, groundwater and drinking water, science and technology, wastewater management, and wetlands, oceans, and watersheds. And as I mentioned before, anytime you see something underlined in my slides, that is a link that will take you to the website for each of these components that are part of um, my slideshow. So if you are particularly interested in, let's say, science and technology around water, that link will take you to their website to show you what's going on. Now, as you can imagine, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who are working in all of these jobs um, because under each of these sub offices, there are programs. There are multiple programs just within the groundwater and drinking water office of the Office of Water of EPA. So, um, you know, I, I really encourage you because we don't have, uh, you know, five days to go through this presentation. It's a fairly short presentation, but it's meant to, no pun intended, whet your appetite for more information. And so I hope that you guys will take uh, the opportunity to do that. Um, I want to call particular attention to the groundwater and drinking water piece because that's kind of what we've been talking about most um, in this internship. We've been talking about the need to conserve water and in our area, um, as you heard, most of our water is imported. 70% of our drinkable water is imported from the state water project, meaning that only around 20% of our water comes from the groundwater underneath Pleasanton. And so it's important for us to understand how groundwater uh, is regulated and protected, and in some ways, how it is not. And so um, there's plenty of room for smart young leaders, just like yourselves, um, to become part of the policy discussion and to become part of the workforce that develops um, programs to protect our groundwater. One of the things we know about our groundwater is that once it is contaminated, it's really hard and really expensive to clean it. And that's why, you know, you may remember news stories about people protesting the Keystone XL pipeline. You remember that? Um, well, a big reason why a lot of people did not want that project to go through is that there would be some very dirty forms of oil, like tar sand oil, running through pipes that could leak, and those pipes were going to be running right over a main aquifer that a lot of our farmland in America uh, relies upon, and a lot of people get their drinking water from that aquifer. It's a huge one uh, in the Central Plains. And so people did not want that pipeline to go through the aquifer because they knew that if those pipes leaked and they contaminated that aquifer, um, that could spoil that water supply for decades to come. So at any rate, all of these offices within the EPA Office of Water are really interesting. So I hope you guys will take some time to check it out on your own. So let's talk now a little bit about our California State Resources Control Board. Um, within that entity, there are three sub offices, drinking water, water quality, and water rights. Now, again, I call your attention to drinking water. They have a lot of programs uh, that are very timely. You'll see COVID-19 and they, you'll see programs around PFAS. And uh, I'm gonna ring my bell for Foothill and Amador students who might be concerned about lead in your water. I gave you a link in the slides uh, that concerns lead sampling in California schools. Um, and I hope that we will talk more about that throughout the, the course of the year, but that's where you'll find some uh, 
some primary documents about the rules concerning lead sampling in schools. Um, water quality is a big piece. I hope you guys will check out the link there because again, it talks about groundwater cleanup. And as you guys may or may not be aware, um, there's been quite a bit of PFAS contamination found in our groundwater and the prospect of cleaning that is really going to be expensive and right now there isn't a, a plan just yet for that. Our, both our city and Zone 7 is working on it, but this part of the California State Water Resources Control Board website talks about those types of things. And then when you talk about water rights, this is actually a really big deal in the state of California. And when you look back at the state of California's history, a lot of the biggest fights politically have happened over water rights. Um, you know, the Central Valley farmers fighting with urban uh, water districts for the same water. Um, we've seen uh, some upstream uh, cities want to build desalination plants, pay for it for the city of San Diego so that they could take their portion of the water that comes from the Colorado River. Um, water rights are a really, really big deal. And in our area, um, the Delta is of a, a primary concern because it's used for so many things. And so many people actually make their living based on the water that flows through the Bay Area, the Bay Delta. Um, so the water rights I, I put on the slide, they deal with programs ranging from everything from the Bay Delta to even cannabis cultivation. You know, there are all kinds of programs around water rights on that web. So that's the state level. Now let's talk about um, this sub piece of the state uh, water board. The, every part of California is part of a regional water board. We're in region two and it's their job to create, as I mentioned before, a water quality control plan. And I listed and gave you links to some of the components of the water quality control plan for region two. Um, and they, there are more. I mean, I, I would have made a really long, ugly slide if I had put all of their components of the water quality control plan on there, but I wanted to highlight a few because this may or may not be something we get a chance to talk about in the rest of the internship because we are fo focused on water conservation, but I just want to make you aware of some of these programs so that if, if you want to research this on your own, pursue a passion project of your own, you'll know where to go for this. So, you know, you see right up at the top there, construction, erosion, and storm water runoff. Storm water runoff is extremely important in the state of California, so much so that until fairly recently, there were parts of California where people were not allowed to capture rainwater because that water belonged to the state and they did not want anybody capturing it in rain barrels uh, because it needed to go into the stormwater system because it was used for something else downstream, whether that was recycled water or you know, some other function, maybe uh, hydroelectric um, plants and things like that. So storm water runoff is a really big deal. And in fact, even our school district, um, as they are using the bond that was passed in 2016 to build some new science buildings at Foothill and Amador and to do some new construction, um, they're required to put in a storm water management plan. And that is because if we don't manage our storm water well, um, we are wasting quite a bit of water. The state of California, this was kind of alluded to in both Eric Cartwright's and Olivia's uh, presentations, that um, you know we've really relied on a snowpack in the Sierra Mountains as one of our primary storage facilities for water in the state of California. And when we had kind of a reliable water cycle and weather patterns, you know, that snow pack would melt slowly over time and trickle into the state water project. Well, when we have late in the year rain or late in the spring rain that doesn't create snow in the mountains or not enough, a lot of that water just runs out to sea. 
because we don't have a lot of storage throughout the state to capture rainwater. So um, now we are starting to change those systems. A lot of the water agencies around the state are starting to look at responsible ways of capturing stormwater and managing stormwater. So that's a big deal. Um, the, the, this part of our uh, water governance structure also deals with um, landfills, you know, the leachate water that comes out of the bottom of landfills. It's their job to control that. So the Altamont landfill and the Vasco Road landfill, which are both in Livermore, you know, are constantly inspected by these folks. Uh, another uh, piece that I'll just mention is non-point source pollution with agriculture. This is a huge, huge issue all over the world, not just here. But um, non-point source pollution means pollution that gets into our water and we're not sure exactly where it happened. So it's hard to stop it. But we do know that there's quite a bit of runoff from agricultural lands, whether that's uh, crops or whether that's animal operations. And for any of you who are vegetarian or vegan and you wanna find out what the state has to say about confined animal feed operations and the water regulations around how they can discharge the, the effluent water that comes from those operations, that's the link you want to, to go to, to see um, what we're doing and maybe what we're not doing about CAFOs, confined animal feed operations. But agricultural runoff can really cause a lot of problems with our water quality. It's often the reason why we have algae blooms. Um, and in the southeast part of the nation, it is not uncommon for there to be habitual lawsuits happening between upstream and downstream uh, states because agricultural runoff upstream that filters downstream to, to uh, more southernmost states can really badly impact their water quality to the point that people can't use it for swimming, for fishing, um, you know, even, you know, it messes up their drinking water supply. So this is a big deal. And this is all under the purview of our regional water board. So let's talk about our local water agencies now. Um, zone seven, you already heard from Olivia, but I wanted to underscore, you know, just how big their responsibility is. I mean, they have to provide treated water to retailers. That means like the city of Pleasanton, the city of Livermore, and parts of San Ramon, the Doherty Valley area, uh, San Ramon, um, and they also provide untreated water. So that means that they don't send it through the water treatment plant. It just comes out of the South Bay aqueduct uh, and can be used to irrigate mostly vineyards. That's what it's primarily for, but there's some a few other uh, parcels that are included in that irrigation water, but it's mostly for the Livermore Valley vineyards. And then they also have to maintain 37 miles of local flood protection channels. So most of our creeks, probably about a third, I would say, of our creeks, arroyos, all the things that you guys are videoing right now for our documentary, um, a lot of those are man-made because of flood control. And you're gonna learn more about this next week when we talk about Pleasanton's water history. You're gonna learn about a huge flood that happened in the, in the 50s and as a result, um, these flood channels were built and zone seven has to maintain them. And part of that maintenance is actually checking the ecosystems. They do all kinds of bug checks and frog checks and fish checks and all that kind of stuff to make sure that the water in those arroyos is healthy um, for the ecosystems. So DSRSD, the Dublin San Ramon Services District, um, they are also responsible for distributing some drinking water. Uh, not for Pleasanton, but for Dublin and parts of the Doherty Valley. But we know them and they're part of our water system because uh, they collect our wastewater and treat it. Um, and they do that for about 163,000 people um, for Dublin, Southern San Ramon and Pleasanton. And that means that everything we, you know, our clothes washers, our sinks, our toilets, um, anything we wash down the drain uh, goes to their treatment facility by the soccer fields at Val Vista, um, kind of over as you're going towards the mall. Uh, that is their facility. And 
So that's where we went last summer. For those of you who were um, interns last summer, that was our wastewater treatment plant uh, um, field trip. The next agency that I want to make you aware of is called LABMA, and it's actually a joint powers agreement, a JPA, between the city of Livermore, the city of Pleasanton, and the Dublin San Ramon Services District. And the main reason that LABMA exists is because our discharged water, um, our wastewater, has to be treated and then it's sent to the San Francisco Bay. And they, I put this map on the slide, even though it's, it's not pretty, but this is a map of the system. And you can see the number one on the map. That is the city of Livermore's wastewater treatment plant. If you've ever seen, um, it looks like a big cylindrical building and they, I think they've painted whales on it and stuff. It's very colorful. Um, it's over, I think on, 84, maybe Isabella. But anyway, that's where their wastewater treatment plant is. And that they have pipes that flow over to the wastewater treatment plant that's here in Pleasanton that we went to last summer. And then kind of across the street from that facility, uh, number two, is number three. And that's um, where there's a pump station. So they they, they pump the treated wastewater to that pump station where you see the number three. And then it follows a pipe all the way through Castro Valley and San Lorenzo and gets to San Leandro at number four where they do the final treatment before that wastewater is dumped into the bay. So the LAVMA board is made up of three city council members from Pleasanton, three city council members from Livermore, and then representatives from the DR, DSR SD board as well. And they have meetings all the time, public meetings. So that's all available on that link that I gave you. And then of course, we know we have the city of Pleasanton. Um, their water system is far more than just creating, you know, drinking water for us, but they do have that. But in addition to creating uh, or, and distributing, potable water for us. They also have to maintain 239 miles of sewer mains, so our sewer pipes and systems, and they also have to make sure that our storm drains are maintained all the time, 24-7, um, because if we get backups or we get pollutants in our storm drains, those drain straight to the bay and we could be fined uh, big time. The city of Pleasanton has also done a feasibility study on recycled water. As you know, we have already done some purple pipes for irrigation for recycled water. But if you look on the link that I gave you in this slide, you'll also see a feasibility study of potable or potable, some people say, um, drinking water basically from recycled water and the kind of technology that would be needed and um, you know that as I mentioned previously is going to be a big issue um, coming up politically for zone 7 and for the city of Pleasanton. Well, one of the things that um, you know for those of you who have done some work with us on waste issues in Pleasanton, um, one of the ways that the the storm drain and the sewer main issues kind of uh, bled over into our waste issues um, happened when the city of Pleasanton adopted the mandatory recycling ordinance and it required that businesses had to have a trash can, recycling can, and a composting can or dumpster in their area. And the city of Pleasanton has ordinances about the trash enclosures that schools and businesses have. When they required these businesses and schools to have more containers in those enclosures, many of the businesses, especially in the Hacienda Business Park, said, we don't have room. And if we have to expand or make our, our enclosures bigger in order to accommodate those extra dumpsters, we're going to have to retrofit those trash enclosures with special storm drain capabilities in order to meet the regulations uh, of the Region 2 Water, Con uh, Water Quality Control Board because they won't let you have uh, garbage and recycling and composting that could seep into the water supply from a trash enclosure. And those things do leak. So they would have to put in special sewage pipes and that would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this was a big issue. It's still a big issue in the Hacienda 
business park for how to deal with where recycling and composting meets water policy. And so this is the interesting stuff about local public policy. So to end the presentation, before I open it up for any questions, um, I, I love this proverb because I think it's so true. Um, pure water is the world's first and foremost medicine. There's, we can't live without pure water. It has the power to make us well, um, and yet uh, it's getting more and more difficult for even a first world country like the United States, even an affluent community like Pleasanton, to get pure water. And um, I'm hoping that you guys, after this internship, will be inspired to be part of the solution, be part of the people who speak up for and advocate for and are willing to convince others to help pay for what it's going to take for us to have pure water and to live well. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and give you guys a chance to ask me anything. Um, I have a question about one of the slides you had. Um, it was the one with the map with all the different zones. Mm -hmm. So the water gets treated in San Leandro and gets dumped to the bay finally, right? Mm -hmm. So why don't we just use all of that water and save like a majority of it for recycled water? That's a great question, Sahana. And part of the reason is at this point, there's so much, as you probably saw on that slide, mm -hmm. the maximum capacity is 41 million gallons a day. We do not have a recycled water plant you know, a reverse osmosis system that could handle even a fraction of that amount of water. And in order to build that, local taxpayers are going to have to invest millions, probably hundreds of millions of dollars to create the capacity to do that. So that's an excellent question. It's both an economic answer and a political answer it is not comfortable for people who, and this is an election year, people who are running for mayor, for city council, for zone seven water board to say, hello, I'm running to make your water better. And I would like for you to start paying another $5,000 a year in taxes so that we can build this facility. They take all kinds of flack for that. And they need educated people who will help advocate for those kinds of expenditures. Um, to help them make that argument because most people don't want to do it. They're like, my water's fine. You know, I turn on my tap, it's fine. Everything's working fine. We don't need to change it. It's a great question. Who else? I have a question about like the storm drains. Uh -huh. so you said that when like we have rain, the water isn't caught because we don't have a system for it. And there's like new systems being implemented right now for that. So like, is there anything happening in Pleasanton about that? That's a great question. And honestly, I don't know the latest information, but the link on my slides, which again are up in Blackboard, they're right with the agenda item for today, um, would lead you to the city's webpage where you could get the latest updates on that. Great question. And I wish I knew off the top of my head, but I do not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? complicated, isn't it? It's very complicated, um, but it's run by human beings, and those human beings may as well be you and people like you who are smart, who get it, and are willing to lead <laughs> for the systems, the water systems that we need in the future. Okay, any other questions before we move on? All right, thanks guys. <laughs>